Good morning, everyone. Are we all faring okay? Here's a fact to encourage all of us. God's church is not hobbled. It's not confused or frustrated. Rather, it's flourishing. It's thriving and spreading its wings. Don't believe me? Just spend a few minutes online looking at how other Jesus-loving churches are connecting. I can't tell you how many emails as a pastor I'm getting daily from Apple, Microsoft, Zoom, Facebook, Adobe, Faithlife, offering our church discounted or free software and media to connect online to stream services, to offer Bible studies from leading scholars and theologians. Do a quick search of the top seminaries and see how much time you spend scrolling through list after list of free online classes, studies, and resources. Take advantage of these, friends. You know, as, as Christ's body, the world desperately needs to hear our voices. What's everyone needing right now? One, clear and calm direction from our doctors and medical leaders. And two, peace, hope, assurance from us, God's church. We, friends, are the calm in the storms of life. We are the peace in the chaos. We are the silver lining in life's looming thunderheads. Christ in us is the light the world needs even right now. Amen? We've talked so much about our front lines. Believe you me, our front lines are vital right now. But pastor, we're stuck at home. I lost my front line. No, not at all. I would say that our front lines have actually broadened. Think of it, how are we connecting, Facebook, messaging, video chatting, even phone calls? Our front line now is this amazing technology at our fingertips. And you know, there are no borders and boundaries in the digital world. There's no map at all for the reach we now have as God's people. So here are two things we can do with this amazing responsibility. First thing, study up with good resources like Bible Gateway, the Bible Project, the Faithlife app. Faithlife are the developers of the projection software we use on Sunday mornings and the online giving service we just implemented. They also make Bible software and have incorporated some phenomenal resources in their app. iOS or Android, download the app and you'll have access to study Bibles, daily devotions, so much more. I've even linked our website, greenwoodschurch.com, so Greenwoods pretty much has a custom app right now thanks to Faithlife. Second thing we can do, connect. Connect with each other. Especially connect with your neighbors in the community. Friends, our front lines are vital right now. People need a touch from heaven right now in the midst of panic, isolation, and despair. People are literally starving for the good news, and we have the good news to share. Amen? One final thought. Our gathered front line as Greenwood's Community Church is our worship. We're finding new ways to connect with God and each other. We are literally reinventing how we do church. That's my challenge each week, even daily as your pastor. How do I continue to do the job that you all hired me to do? The front line of worship is what we're doing right now, amen? God is all about creativity, innovation, and connecting. And friends, that's what we're doing. God is in this, I have no doubt at all. I believe with all my heart that God is saying, even right now, my children find new and creative ways to love me and love your neighbors as yourselves. I created you, each and every one of you, to innovate and creatively connect with me and each other, and you're doing just that, my children. Well done. So be encouraged, family. Maximize the time and the resources we have at our fingertips. Post encouraging and loving things. Share the good news. God bless you, all of you. We're just a couple of weeks away from Easter, so we're preparing ourselves by looking at some of the prophecies that Jesus fulfills in Isaiah chapter 53. Today, we're looking at the final verse of Isaiah 53, which describes 
the paradoxical and unlikely circumstance that the anointed one of the Lord would find himself identifying with transgressors, criminals, the disloyal, the rebels, the lowest of the low, or perhaps even lower. Here's what we read in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12. He willingly submitted to death, and he was counted among the rebels. Yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. The prophecy of the Messiah comes with a twist. It's actually quite surprising. Who would have expected that the greatest man to ever live would be counted among criminals, be judged along with other criminals, and die a criminal's death with criminals? It's really almost blasphemous. Yet it's right there in our Bibles. But maybe this twist shouldn't be too surprising. I mean, after all, the life of the Messiah began with a twist. Anyone reading a story of any great hero would expect that hero to come from noble origins. King Arthur's father was a king. Hercules was a demigod. Superman, well... He was from another planet, not necessarily from royal lineage, but his story is born from extraordinary circumstances. Our solar system's yellow sun combined with the Earth's atmosphere gives his alien body unbelievable strength, and the physics breaking abilities to fly and dodge bullets, among many other powerful abilities. But then we come to Jesus. The story of Jesus begins with a humble birth in an unmucked stable, not a palace or a hospital, not even a home. And this birth is attended by unkempt shepherds, the working class, certainly not the upper class. Some would say that when it comes to shepherds, there's no class at all. So maybe it shouldn't be surprising that when Jesus died, he died with the lowest class maybe even without any class. 700 years before his coming, Isaiah wrote the prophecy we're exploring today. Let's just listen to it one more time. Isaiah 53, verse 12. He willingly submitted to death and was counted among the rebels, yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. So the story of the greatest life ever lived is that while being sentenced to death, he was labeled a criminal, and while being executed, he was hung up between two other criminals. Against all odds, Jesus was one compared to Barabbas, and two crucified between two criminals. To prepare us for Easter, let's read the historical account from the book of Matthew. All four Gospels cover this account, so if you want to read them all on your own, I would certainly encourage all of us to do that. The book of Matthew is the Jewish account. Matthew is Jewish, writing to a predominantly Jewish audience. So he's going to refer to the festival, which he assumes everyone will know is the festival of Passover. Uh, because, after all, every Jew knows that the festival of all festivals is Passover. Here's what we read in Matthew 27, verses 15 to 26. At the festival, the governor's custom was released to the crowd a prisoner they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who is it you want me to release for you? Barabbas, or Jesus, who was called Christ. For he knew it was because of envy that they had handed him over. Matthew was there, he was an eyewitness, so he adds an interesting tidbit that no other gospel mentions. He says in verse 19, While he was sitting on the judge's bench, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for today I have suffered terribly in a dream because of him. The chief priests and the elders, however, persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to execute Jesus. The governor asked them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? Barabbas, they answered. Pilate asked them, What should I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all answered, Crucify him. Then he said, Why? 
What has he done wrong? But they kept shouting all the more, Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that a riot was starting instead, he took some water, washed his hands in front of the crowd, and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. All the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, and, after having Jesus flogged, handed him over to be crucified. Barabbas was a murderer. He led a rebellion against the Romans. He and his followers had killed people. Pilate compared Jesus with Barabbas because he actually wanted to set Jesus free. You know, Pilate was pleading on Jesus' behalf. You can hear the desperation in Pilate's voice, especially in last week's scriptures. Barabbas was the biggest scoundrel he could find, a traitor, a terrorist for the Romans, really, and a murderer. Pilate thought that if he offered the crowd the choice of letting a murderer like Barabbas go, or Jesus, they would absolutely choose Jesus. But they didn't. So Jesus was led to Golgotha, where he was crucified between two thieves. All four Gospels carry this theme of the Messiah being counted among criminals as well. I'll keep reading from the book of Matthew. Verse 27, Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the governor's residence and gathered the whole company around him. They stripped him and dressed him in a scarlet robe. They twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and placed a staff in his hand. And then they knelt down before him and mocked him, Hail, King of the Jews! Then they spat on him, took the staff, and kept hitting him on the head. After they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they found a Cyrenian man named Simon. They forced him to carry his cross. When they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they gave him wine mixed with gall to drink, but when he tasted it, he refused to drink it. After crucifying him, they divided his clothes by casting lots. Then they sat down and were guarding him there. Above his head they put up the charge against him in writing, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two criminals were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. In one of the greatest endings of all time, one of those criminals has the audacity, the gall, or the sense, to ask Jesus to save him. Luke writes, Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him. Don't you even fear God, since you are undergoing the same punishment? We are punished justly, because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. That was Friday afternoon. The Jewish day ends at sunset. Jesus died at 3 p.m. So before the sunset, that man, that criminal, was in heaven. In Ephesians 4, Paul tells us that Jesus descended into hell and led captives free. That happened on Holy Saturday. All those who died before Jesus, but had placed their trust in God for a future Savior, were led free from hell on Holy Saturday. But the day before, on Good Friday, the thief on the cross beat them all to heaven, because Jesus delivered him there first. Interesting. Back to our Isaiah 53 prophetic fulfillment. Why would God let his son be placed among criminals? Why? It was awful, humiliating, degrading. Why would God let his son die with criminals? Because Jesus wasn't a criminal. But I am a criminal. We're all criminals, yes. But pastor, I've never been convicted of a crime. Friends, when it comes to God's holiness and goodness, and his holy calling and plan for his people, each of us has committed many crimes. 
I was a junior in high school. I had just been inducted into the National Honor Society. The pressure to do well intensified that year, and it stressed me out. I was in biology class, and there was an exam, and I wasn't prepared. I was involved with the school musical, which took up almost all of my free time, and to be honest, cutting frogs open and talking about mitochondria just really didn't float my boat. So here I am at this exam, not prepared. I wasn't doing well in the class already, and now, as a National Honor Society member, I was really worried about getting kicked out. I was sweating. My stomach was cramping with anxiety. I was completely blanking on all the questions of this exam. Things didn't look good, and the pressure to do well was breathing down my neck. I glanced to the floor, and my biology book was sitting right there. I was cramming before the test and had forgotten to put it away. I don't cheat, friends. I take coursework very seriously. The respect from my teachers is vital to me. But in that moment, could I sneak a peek? I could, right? No one would know, and maybe I'd get a couple of these answers right and not fail. Time's up, the teacher announced. And like I was in a movie, the teacher made eye contact with me and said, Trip, can I see you after class? My heart dropped. He knew. Cut to after class. There I am in his office, and he's angry. He said this to me, Trip, I must be crazy. I can't believe I'm about to say this to you, but I must be going insane. Did I see you actually open your textbook during the test? My thoughts were racing. Tell him you dropped your pencil. Tell him you were looking for gum, a mint. And here's the next thought I had, and I still hear this voice. He knows you go to church. Admit it. Tell the truth. You have to. So I confessed. Tears in my eyes. I emotionally vomited all the stress and panic I was feeling. But I told the truth. I had to. Friends, we're going to mess up. We're human. It's in our nature. We're criminals. Because we will constantly break God's laws as his people. Guaranteed. And he knows this. There are no white lies. A lie is a lie. There are no passing glances. Lust is lust. And believe me, we can recklessly and carelessly wield our words against each other. We are all guilty of murder when it comes to anger, hasty words against each other. So Jesus was counted with criminals, yet he wasn't a criminal. And because we are. When a person comes to the realization that they are a lawbreaker, they usually do one of two things. They either brush it off thinking, yeah, I've broken the law, but not very badly, and really, Everyone breaks the law at some point. It's impossible not to. I've thought that way before, and that way of thinking is a big mistake. Do you remember when large cities started putting up traffic cameras to record driver behavior at stoplights? I remember it really well. At major intersections, these cameras filmed drivers and then sent tickets in the mail to everyone who ran red lights. During that time, a person who ran a red light could run the red light and keep going. No one would stop them, and it would be tempting to think, phew, got away with that one, but the camera was always watching. And then a few weeks later, a citation showed up in the mail. <sighs> Brushing off a violation doesn't relieve you of the violation. God's eyes are always watching. You know, while some people brush off their offenses, others beat themselves up over them. I'm terrible. I'm worthless. I can never be forgiven. The third reason God allowed Jesus to be counted among criminals was because, no matter how low we think we are, Jesus actually went lower. Jesus came down to our level in order to bring us up to his Matthew records his comparison to criminals and his crucifixion with criminals so that every person can know that no matter how far down they've gone, 
Jesus actually went further. Matthew records his death with criminals. Mark records it. Luke records it. John records it. And Isaiah recorded it 700 years before it happened. And Paul records it from a heavenly perspective in the book of Philippians. In fact, Philippians chapter 2, it's one of the most important pieces of literature ever written, because Philippians 2 records the depths Jesus went in order to demonstrate his love for us. Listen to Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. Paul says, Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. Do you hear Paul describing the depths to which Jesus descended in order to demonstrate his unfailing love for each and every one of us? Follow me for a moment, please. First, Paul is saying Jesus was God. He is God, fully God. That's where he started. Jesus was and is equal with God. Imagine this, God the Father, God the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, all equally divine, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, contemplating how to help humanity. One of us will have to go down there. We'll have to shed some of our omnis to become like one of them. The Son, the second member of the Trinity, says, I'll do it. Paul says in verses 6 to 7, He did not regard equality with God something to be held on to. He willingly emptied himself. So step two, he emptied himself. Jesus emptied himself of some of his divinity. He laid aside a portion of his deity. And step three, he took on human form. He became human, mortal, like us. That's called the incarnation. God the Son took on human flesh. He walked around like us, talked like us, felt like us hurt like us, thirsted and hungered like us, needed food and shelter like us. He felt isolated, lonely, depressed even, like many of us now. That's a big step down, isn't it? Can you imagine what the angels said when they heard that God the Son was going to do this? He's going to do what? No, he will not. He cannot. We're not going to let him. Well, heaven had nine months to get used to the idea, and apparently they came around to seeing it as a good thing because an army of them sang glory to God in the highest at Jesus' birth. Hallelujah. So now God the Son is human. You'd think all of these demotions would be enough to earn our trust, wouldn't you? But Jesus goes down further still. Paul says in verse 7, instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant. He descended to earth as a man, and then he stepped down again, not by insisting on being treated like a king or a nobleman or someone special. No, Jesus descended even further and positioned himself at the very bottom rung of the social ladder by becoming a servant. He became a servant. Wherever he went, Jesus served people. In Mark 10, Jesus carefully explained his purpose to the disciples when he said, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus didn't just come to be one of us. He became a servant to us. But surely that should be far enough down, shouldn't it? Apparently not, because Jesus didn't stop there. Paul says that Jesus took a fifth step downward to the level we're talking about today, the level of a criminal. Verses 7 to 8, And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. And in the process of becoming obedient to the point of death, 
Jesus let himself be associated with criminals. Here we are at step five. Jesus humbled himself to a criminal status. And then, of course, he actually went even farther and submitted to a criminal's death. He let them crucify him. He became obedient to the point of death. And surely, friends, that should be enough. No, Jesus is God. And God, friends, never does anything halfway. Amen. So God didn't just let created humans kill his son by burning him or drowning or beheading. Step seven, Jesus became obedient to death on a cross. Crucifixion was the most humiliating death possible for an Orthodox Jew, or really anyone for that matter. Listen to this, hundreds, hundreds of years earlier, God had decreed in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23, that anyone hung on a tree is under God's curse. Wow. Jesus stepped down and became a curse. How far down did Jesus come for us? Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity, and when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. No one, and nothing, has ever traveled down as far as Jesus has. He stepped so far down that we would know that no matter how far down we think we are, Jesus has come all the way down to us and even further. That's the incredible news of God's love for us. Amen? No mind can fully conceive and no odds could ever even begin to calculate the likelihood that God would do anything like this for us. You know, isn't it like our God to flip the paradigms we try and come up with? Listen to this. In God's economy, what comes down must go up. Hallelujah. So the second half of Paul's description of Jesus' descent is Jesus' elevation. Hallelujah! We read, For this reason God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's Philippians 2 verses 9 through 11. Friends, you'll be pleased to know that for every step Jesus took downward, God brought him back upward and then some. In Jesus' elevation, one, God lifted him up. Step two, God gave him the greatest name, the name that is above every name. God promises that step three, every knee in heaven will bow. And step four, every knee on earth will bow. And step five, every knee under the earth will bow. Wow. And continuing on, step six, every tongue will confess his lordship. And finally, step seven, the Father will get glory. Every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Jesus came down, 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 down so we could go up. God lifted Jesus up because he came down. There's a lesson in there for us. If we want to go up, what are we to do? Well, like Jesus, we must go down. We must become servants. The reason Jesus came all the way down to the level of a criminal was so that any of us who feel as low as a criminal, or even lower, and I've been there. We'll never wonder if he could love us. Because he does, friends. He's been that low. He's been even lower. He died among us. Why? 
because he loves us. Today is the day to break down all your barriers and let Jesus in. Let him into your life. Let him into your heart. Let him pay for your sin. Pray these words with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming down to me. Thank you for dying with criminals for me. I admit, Lord, I've done some things that are morally wrong. I admit I'm a lawbreaker, and I want you to forgive me. I accept your payment for my crimes. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for taking on the punishment I deserve. I invite you to be my Lord and my Savior. Lord, you are with us. Help others to see you in us. For indeed, we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. So may you shine in us and through us, Lord Jesus. We need thee every hour. We need thee. Oh, we need thee. We praise you. We love you. And we live to serve and share you, Jesus. And it's in your holy, precious name we pray. And the church said, Amen. God bless each and every one of you.